uh, on the 11th of January, 1973, uh, five burglars from Watergate Hotel uh, went uh, before the court, uh, got up before the court and subsequently began the Watergate hearings in the in the US Congress Senate. And the end is uh, first and the only so far resignation of US president. Mm. I would like to start with with an easy question for you. Do you think that Watergate 2.0 is possible today? And if not, why not? You mean burglaries? No, <laughs> no, I mean the outcome of a journalistic um, Well, it's a action. very good question um, because I've spent a lot of time um, not on the burglary itself. I have friends who did lots of reporting at the time and then subsequently books and so on about it. And obviously I followed it closely as I did the hearings. Um, so, um, Watergate was not covered by any newspapers of any size after it happened, and no one picked up the Washington Post stories. Um, eventually, in the spring of that year, uh, Cy Hirsch, working then for the New York Times, and uh, Sandy Smith, working for Time Magazine, both investigative reporters, which was an odd uh, category of reporter at that point. Uh, there were very few at that time. Uh, there were only two uh, news organizations that even had an investigative team in the United States. Um, and then by this fall, uh, Nixon having won by a landslide, uh, it uh, bigger than anyone else, as I recall, um, uh, or was it, let me take, take that again, I, one of the biggest landslides in American history. Um, things began to change. And the question is why? And I'm not sure I have the answer to that question, personally. I'm spending actually a lot of time thinking about it, researching it, looking at my own files or memories. But what it did do, as you just mentioned, was that a president eventually resigned. Uh, and that in turn, those hearings opened up all kinds of doors um, for investigations, both by Congress and others, and uh, turned investigative reporting into a Hollywood movie and best-selling books. and and, an, and a um, uh, profession that I had uh, recently joined back in 69 and 70, uh, which had resulted for me personally in uh, what I would call repressive acts by the state on, the, on a local state and federal level, as well as right-wing vigilantes and so on. That's the literary criticism I got back in 69 and 70 from in the local community in the middle of the war in San Diego. All of this changed. And um, I became a legitimate citizen. Um, so could a transformation like that take place today in the United States? I don't think so. Um, I think one of the uh, key things that is different, because I was trying to think of what was different then from now, particularly involving the power of the media um, and its ability uh, to get public attention and public attention focused. And, and that is, there was no internet. And that led to a different kind of electronic broadcasting in the United States and most of the Western world. It was a form of communication that actually operated in the quote, public interest. By the way, a standard that still exists on the US laws, although not 
reflected in the internet, but for broadcasting. But after 60 years of regulation, all was wiped out in 1987. And so we are in a different kind of situation where um, no one knows what to trust and no one trusts anybody else. And so I don't think it could happen today, especially in the same way as it did then. But uh, <clears throat> forgive me, when we compare, for example, Nixon's crime of the bugging and the cover-up, and for example, 6th of January, well, somebody called it coup, attempt of coup, the other was riots or attack on the Capitol or whatever it is. But when yeah. we compare these two crimes, the one on Donald Trump plate is much bigger than the Nixon's and nothing happened so far. Nixon's crimes, and some of them are detailed in the uh, uh, grand jury proceedings and other documents from that period. Um, in some way, you'd have to say were more insidious and uh, potentially uh, likely to become more successful in the sense that Donald Trump is not a person who who plans, who reflects, who has uh, a network of people with levers of power, who understands the institutional situation that he's actually in and the traditions of the organization he's dealing with. Nixon did. And the Watergate hearings uh, and subsequent investigations um, revealed that Nixon's White House was at one point considering at creating a, a national roundup and a um, and a, creating an author a true authoritarian state. Interestingly enough, it was the divisions within the institutions that were brought into this discussion um, that ended that, and that was because that plan, which was revealed during Watergate, it was known as the Houston Plan. And um, and by the way, I was on the list. Um, I, I, while I didn't know such a plan was being pursued, uh, I felt it in the air. I, I felt it for a variety of different reasons. It was a different kind of situation. Uh, Donald Trump is more of a phenomenon of mass psychology, um, of a, uh, a population, unlike the population in the United States in 1973, that is at every moment bombarded with information that's demonstrably false. And so, for example, you could not get on television in the United States or nationwide radio in the United States and preach segregation. Wouldn't have happened by, by 73. There are various FCC and other regulations and orders and Supreme Court things and so on that had taken place by 69. It couldn't happen. So Donald Trump, in fact, when I saw him getting on the stage in 2015, where he first agreed, got involved in a wrestling match with Megyn Kelly and then everybody else on the stage, that couldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. He would have been bleeped out. He would have been banned. The various platforms, which we, in those days we called them networks, the various platforms involved, as well as regular traditional broadcasting, would have endangered their licenses for putting someone on the stage who preached hate speech, who lied, who had disinformation, et cetera. So we're in two different circumstances. And January 6th, as horrific as it was, was the worst thing Trump could have done in many ways, because it un it uncovered who what who and what he really wanted. There was no way he could deny that. Even then, as you've seen 
Republican politicians and a large section of the American population believes it didn't happen or Intifada did it or somebody did it or they don't know who did it, right? Uh, and, it's, and, and it's celebrated. But it's not organized in the way that a normal authoritarian state happens. We are recording this conversation uh, one day after midterm elections. It's not our subject, but as we mentioned Trump, uh, can you imagine that something similar can happen again quite soon, possibly in two years' time? All depends. Uh, it depends on the economy. It depends on uh, the ability of the... Um, what I'll call the established state in America, as well as mass movements of people to uh, recognize the danger we have lurking because we have no way to create a communal, we have no way to, to damage a, a communal understanding of how the world should work as long as no one, as long as there are alternative facts, as long as you can make something up and then repeat it enough times so that people believe it, right? Uh, I think that the internet platforms who have been pretty arrogant about not having any controls uh, will see that with increasing, um, I think pretty relatively rapidly, and we're already seeing it in the EU, uh, will be will will find themselves dealing with more and more regulation, particularly on content, uh, in the months and and years ahead, immediately. Because I think there's more and more consciousness now that that the kind of pure tolerance that has existed since the birth of the internet might have been fine when it was a dial-up startup back in the early '90s, mid '90s but now has blown out of control. And people in your audience should never forget that in the 1920s and early 30s, the new technology radio, which was becoming, uh, was becoming controlled in the US actually first uh, by a presidential, a president behind it, Herbert Hoover, radio content was under control. Licenses were being lifted in the United States for hate speech, for disinformation, for lying to the public about products. And by 1931, the courts had upheld the right of the US government to do that. That didn't happen in the Weimar Republic. The Nazis could not really get in the local newspapers or the national newspapers in Germany. They were clowns. They were cartoonists. The way they got to the people, as Goebbels said in 1934, was through radio. And he couldn't, they couldn't have done it without radio. Unfiltered, immediate communication with masses of people with no filter. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with you completely. It's a good comparison. Um, I want to jump through some questions because I don't want to take uh, many of your time. Yeah, no, okay, the, I'm the, talking too long. I know it. that's what everybody. No, 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 no. I like it. No, I, no, I, I, like I, I complained it. about people who do that. <laughs> no, no, I can. I would like to talk for you with you for hours, but I, I promised uh, some, okay. some. And, then I went, and I, you said fifteen minutes, and I figured it was going to be half an hour or more. Yeah, so, yeah, a little yes. more. Oh, I have well. to get off at, at a quarter to uh, eleven my time, which is okay. twenty. Minutes. Okay, we we will finish by then. Uh, the next thing I would like to re uh, for you to re reflect on are so-called invest no so-called investigative projects of a journalist around the world, especially through international consortium of investigative journalists. You participated in that as well. But we have, for example, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, Pandora Papers, some other papers. Huge scandals, great journalistic effort, uh, very interesting data. And the outcome is what? 
For example, a side of prime minister of Iceland who resigned, nothing happened. And I can tell you that Nick Davis, for example, was deeply, he told me that, he was deeply disappointed, not only in investigative journalism, but in journalism in general. That's why he went to Argentina to ride horses, uh, among other, other things, and he doesn't want to do a journalism anymore, unlike you, for example. And he said, you are right when I ask him the same questions, and I ask all of my interlocutors the same questions, because I would like all of you to reflect on the same topics. Um, and he said, that's right. That's exactly what happened. Nothing happened. We investigated, we found some, some distortion of, of uh, justice, of uh, ruling of law, and nothing happened. What do you think about that? Well, I think Nick's being a little um, spoiled. Um, one of the interesting things to me that I learned over time was you don't do stories because you think something is going to change. You do stories because you think that they're, they're true or they're correct or that information needs to get in the outside world. You might be lucky in certain cases that there's a people take, paying attention, for instance, and it's immediately relevant. There are a number of stories that I've done that nobody paid attention to when they came out until they couldn't ignore it. So in 1998, I think it was late 98, early 99, we did an hour documentary right after the Nairobi uh, bombings um, for Frontline. I think it was the lowest rated Frontline that year. Something like that. Um, some guy wearing a turban far away, who cares, cartoon, um, you know, over with bombings in Nairobi, Tanzania, far away. The day uh, of and afterwards, um, that documentary became a tape loop on PBS. And the, the White House asked, in those days of video cassettes, asked for a video cassette so they could look at it. Um, so you can't expect a one-to-one, -one, first of all. And, and number two, um, uh, I think maybe, I, but I agree about this probably with Nick. Because we have a world of alternate facts, because we have a unmitigated flood of information, it's impossible for most people to figure out what's true and what's not. In the United States, we not only lifted regulation of content on the pu public forum, using government sponsored and paid for technology, um, but we have adopted legally a doctrine of pure tolerance, anything goes. So you don't want the government to regulate anything. You say the First Amendment says Congress won't do anything to um, uh, impinge on the freedom of the press, et cetera. That is now accepted by the right-wing Cato Institute and if the leftist ACLU, they all agree. Well, that's, that's gonna get you in big trouble. And the reason is it's watered down what is worthy of people hearing and seeing and experiencing. And I'm not talking on small group behavior. I'm talking on mass platforms with institutional reach. And they have to have a community responsibility. And it's only now the EU is doing it to a certain extent. It's under discussion in the US now that we're beginning to quote, reform that wild west of the internet, but it may be too late. And the uh, final question, because our time is running out, I don't have a Zoom professional, <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but quickly in one sentence, in your opinion, Julius Assange is a whistleblower or a useful idiot, as some people say? Um, both. And uh, unfortunately, emotionally 
unbalanced in ways that have turned out to hurt himself. And what about the state of journalism in the era of populism, polarization, and post-truth, three Ps, as I like to call them? How do you see the future of journalism? Well, I want to finish briefly the, the uh, reference to ICIJ and leaks. The problem with leaks is that whoever leaks has a motive. And that's what, as journalists, we need to know. What was the motive? It points us in certain directions. So the idea that the United States is um, a great money launderer in many ways, internally, because it was, as an example of those leaks, right, ignores the use of other locations where there are leaks. Why would someone leak that? I think at some point or another, there's going to be more reflection and reporting, as I call it, against your story before you release. Just allowing people to dump in some place and have anonymity takes out of the calculus what we normally used to have when we had a confidential source. What is the motive of the confidential source? So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of your question, please repeat your question quickly. You know. The future of uh, journalism, especially investigative journalism in the world, uh, which is characterized with three Ps, if I'm not wrong, that's what I like to call them, three Ps, popular, populism, polarization, and post-truth. Well... I don't know what the future is, or if there is a future, because things have become so polarized. Um, facts have become something we question rather than ones than we that we discuss and try to maintain some kind of ability to assess them. For the future to, I think, for us to have a future in what you're calling investigative reporting, you know, in my day when I started, it didn't exist. They didn't give Pulitzer Prizes in investigative reporting. Well, they called us muckrakers in the American tradition um, or troublemakers. Um, the future really depends upon the, the survival and expansion of public education in a real sense. In the United States, at least, we have defunded public education on a mass level across the country over the last four, almost, what is it now, 40 years, starting in California. And that is happening, remember, in California at the same time that we've just gone through Watergate and had all these hearings and so on, and the atmosphere has changed. Investigative reporting is flourishing at that point. Uh, that's how I got hired by the networks and went to work at ABC and then 60 Minutes and CBS and then so on. It became something people wanted to do in the profit making as well as the nonprofit sector. So that's collapsing with the polarization and on both sides actually in some ways and, uh, and a failure to understand or prioritize how we build a new common meeting place, a new way to have a conversation. Mr. Bergman, thank you very much for your time. It was a great honor for me. I will send you this uh, conversation right now via vTransfer on your email, Gmail. You will get it if you need anything else within this project or outside of this project you never know maybe you will need something from our region i'm at your disposal i can't thank you enough it was a great pleasure and great honor for me thank you thank you very much that's a magazine cover back there yes i can see it an alternative magazine that appeared in 1972 and the cover is a drawing of richard nixon as a gangster
<laughs> I can see the hat and the beard, but I didn't recognize Nixon. Nixon. From I have a lot of in my retirement. I have all of these old stuff coming through. You know, but it's good luck where you are. I believe Serbia is trying to get in the EU, so maybe you'll have the advantage of their new regulations. Yeah, I hope so. I certainly hope so. I'm on your side. I'm inspired by you and other journalists that I have I have mentioned before, but maybe it's exaggerating, but you are one of my idols, if I oh, can great. have one send professionally. Send money. <laughs> Yes, I will send send me send me your account number and I'll do that. Okay, uh, it'll be in the mail. <laughs> I'll hope I'll meet you in person relatively soon. And thanks once again. Good luck. Let me see. Um, I'm be interested to see what you do. Of course, of course. You How can much count. time do you get on the air with this project? Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Twenty yeah. minutes oh. and two and two parts. Part one and part two. Forty combined. You know, I I remember when twenty minutes was considered an eternity <laughs> in broadcasting. <laughs> Take care. Oh.